This was brought to you by Franklin County Internet Gaming Society on YouTube and Facebook. There is an aesthetic compulsion, an inner dynamism propelling us toward divine wholeness. It must remain unconscious and so compelling. This compulsion may take the form of a need for a secret. Paradoxically, perhaps, this final wholeness necessarily remains unconscious, dark and hidden. Tom Chiefman, Green Man, Earth Angel, The Prophetic Tradition and the Battle for the Soul of the World. We like to believe that we are thinking, rational beings aware of the world around us to a greater degree than is possible for any animal. We fool ourselves as mystics from cultures the world over have said from time immemorial. We are only sleeping, dreaming that we are awake. If this is true, then reality is not what we think it is. We see only the part of life that filters through to our dream. There is a greater world out there full of things unseen and literally undreamt. We know it. We have but to awaken. That is what a mage does, he awakens and begins to consciously dream new things into existence. Mythic History The sea of time grows murky as one approaches the distant past. Ruins, artifacts, cave paintings. All this evidence of history tells an incomplete tale. Even master mages cannot part the curtains of time so far back to see what truly occurred. Magical orders have a mythology about their beginnings. The leg end of a fallen civilization and a war for the throne of reality. The name for that civilization are many, most of them lost over the years, but even the sleeping know one of them and seek evidence of its truth. Atlantis, the island of the Magi, for many years uncounted in the far distant past. Mortals suffered at the whim of monsters haunted by spirits and preyed upon by bloodthirsty revenants. Mortals in those times adhered dogmatically to fearsome superstitious customs which proved their only means of keeping weak spirits at bay while appeasing the strong ones. Beset by creatures stronger than they, pulled by howling beasts whenever they migrated into territories whose borders they couldn't possibly perceive. Mortals found it nigh impossible to advance above their need for su survival to envision ways of living outside of fear. Then came the dragon dreams. Certain mortals in lands scattered far and wide began to dream of an island, a lonely land jutting from a windswept sea far from any known coast. A spire rose from the center of the isle, pointing at 
the pole star. It seemed to be the dreamers that this was the axis of the world, the pole upon which the bow of the sky turned, and upon this pole, at its apex, nested the dragons. In the dreams, these great worms of legend would rise up into the winds, one by one, circle the spire with their beating, learning, lethern wings, and set off towards the infinite horizon, to places the dreamers could not imagine. No other creature stirred on the isle, and no spirit hunted there. No being dared intrude upon the dragon's lair. As the dreams progressed, the dreamers came to realize that the dragons never returned. Each night, another dragon would leave so that the remaining numbers grew small. Finally, the last dragon took wing and glided away to the west, never again to be seen. The dreams continued to come, but now the isle was empty. Nothing moved there. For many nights, the dreamers saw the isle, abandoned and forlorn, and knew that it waited for them. The island had called to them, compelling them, seeking new inhabitants. Following the lead of the dreamers, small bands of mortals set out to see from many different lands, each following the vision given to them in dreams. They sought the island where, far from the lands of predation, they knew they would be free to forge their own destinies, unafraid of the night. They came to the isle following the pole star and saw that it was exactly as seen in their dreams. Mortals from many lands speaking many languages and following di different customs came together and by silent ascent settled in peace with no conflict, for they have traveled far, fleeing from struggle. And still they dreamed. The island sent them new visions and showed them how they might learn to master the strange sights to which their sleeping minds had been privy. They began practicing the techniques of Hesychia, the stillness, or incubation, in which they retreated into dark caves and their bodies entered deep sleep while their minds traveled to far astral realms beyond the kin of their mortals, of other mortals. There they met the others, the demons of their own soul, the hidden twin of each soul traveler. These judges challenged them to prove by what right they came on astral roads to the realms supernal, and set them to a series of tests. Many failed, sent back to their bodies in sorrow, unable to again journey forth in dream. But some succeeded. These fews returned with their souls aglow, lit by a celestial fire. They could see into the realms invisible and keep the secret working of creation. The principles and substances from which everything was wrought. Through this sympathy, their far journeying souls now shared with the realms supernal and the knowledge they gleaned 
from studying realms. Visible and invisible, they could call down the ways of heaven, the higher principles that ruled over the lower realms of matter and spirit. They made their very thoughts real, imagination rendered into matter and flesh. They had discovered magic, the dragon's tomb. It was as if all mortals were asleep. Only the dreamers of the Dragon Isle, who had returned victorious from their astral journeys, were awake. The Magi dreamed with their eyes open. They pondered how it was that they, among all mortals, had attained this gift. It seemed that only on their island refuge within its deep caves removed from the tumult of the senses could their souls fly free of their bodily fetters and touch the astral stars. But mortals had lived in caves before and had withdrawn from the world in deep meditation, yet none had awakened. The Magi suspected that the isle, island itself had mystical properties. Had it not been the abode of dragons, creatures made from the celestial fire, had it not guided them there through dreams, had it not called to them, and had they not answered? Investigating the depths of the caves with their newfound vision, they unearthed huge crystals and shapes that suggested bones. Some believed they had found the remains of dead dragons. The power resonant in the crystals had called to sensitive mortal souls like moths to light. Was this secret of the Isle's powers? Crystals <clears throat> that resonated with supernal energy. They named the caves the Dragon's Tomb and built their city atop it. Later mages, skeptics, raised in the modern world would scoff at the tale. They would know that places could well up with magical energy and even take upon the atmosphere of the supernal realms provided that the shard from a mage's show so distilled into material form anchored its not literally winged reptiles, but supernal ideas representing the concept of magic itself. The crystal bones acted as conduits to the supernal, the source of magic. In this way, some would say Atlantis formed a natural version of what would later be called a domain, a place pregnant with supernal power where magic could be practiced as of old before the fall. The Awakening, the Awakened City. The loose confederation of immigrants to the island soon organized into a city-state led by the Magi. They called it Atlantis, which in their polyglot tongue meant the ocean spire. Over time, the Enlightened found separate orders to fulfill the roles of governance, from mystical militia to scholars to a priesthood of the mysteries to guide them all.
The Magi of Atlantis traveled once more to the forsaken lands from whence they came, searching for few clues into the mysteries. The tantalizing yet obscure secrets that ruled over everything that was, is, and shall be. Mortals there witnessed their power, and word of them spread as rumors and, le and legends. Many left their homes to seek fabled Atlantis, the island of the Magi. Only a few found it, the rest wandered the ocean for years. No chart marked its place. The stars no longer guided mariners to its rocky shores. Only those who saw it in dreams could find their way. The newcomers went to the tomb and sent their minds inward, but most of them failed the test of their diamonds and were lost in the uncharted wilderness of their souls. Their empty bodies took days to die. Others were severed from their bodies by a terrible by the terrible demons they found dwelling within their own dreams. Only a few in any group could pass the test and became magi. Rumors came now and then of foreign sorcerers, men and women who had also attained the realms supernal on their own far from Atlantis, but they were rare. These people more often than not destroyed themselves by misuse of their power or were killed by commerce who feared their wizardry. Only in Atlantis were the Ars Mysteriorum mastered and codified for others to learn. Vomitology, the practice of magic, was intertwined with the theory of magic. How it was that the mortal mind was able to will reality to do what it wanted. The Atlanteans believed that the practice of magic was the purposeful incarnation by a mage of the supernal, the heavenly or celestial, into the lower prosaic realm of matter, including the subtle realm of spiritual matter, call, matter called ephem ephemera. The mage, by virtue of his soul's attainment, uh, to the higher realms could bring the rulership of those realms down into the common world through sympathy. The principle that like can affect like regardless of distance. But a sympathetic connection through the soul was not enough. The mind had to understand the complex tapestry of the universe, how the patterns of various things were woven into a whole. Only by understanding the threads could a mage weave them into patterns of his own devising. These threads were the ten arcana that comp comp comprised all of reality from high to low. The Atlanteans also pondered the reasons behind their art. They knew with certainty that there was more to reality than what met the common eye, and that there was more 
within one state of existence beyond the material. They believe that behind the many forms and shapes of things, the world was in fact one, heaven and earth together in a single continuum. Subtle veils divided the realms and states of being from one another, separating high from low and creating the illusion of division. This was brought to you by Franklin County Internet Gaming Society on YouTube and Facebook, Roger Hansen on Patreon, and Gaming with Infamous on Discord. Thanks for stopping by. Listen to our podcast on any of these platforms. Inker, Breaker, Overcast, Pocket Casts, Radio Public, Spotify. Support us on Patreon. And check us out on Discord. All the links can be found in the video description below. We thank you for your participation. If you enjoyed please like, subscribe, share, make comments. We love feedback.